I'm John Roberts, and I'm moderating today. And to have a representative of the presidency of the European Union is for me a particular delight, since I come from a country that, for some weird reason beyond human understanding and comprehension, appears determined to throw itself off the cliff and leave the EU. Um, in the meantime, can I welcome the fact that we have an extraordinarily distinguished panel. As I said, we have Anna Birchall, the Deputy Prime Minister of Romania. We have George Sasakis, the Minister of Environment and Energy and Climate Change of Greece. We have Gerasimus Thomas from the European Commission, the Director General for Energy. We have Ambassador Richard Morningstar, who did so much to work on um, developing the oil and gas pipelines that come from the Caspian, and to whom I have to be very nice because he employs me from time to time. <laughs> and we have Tristan Asprey of ExxonMobil, and ExxonMobil, of course, has one or two interests in the area, and we might actually hear something about their work in Cyprus in the next uh, few minutes. So without any further ado, can I ask Anna Birchall to give some opening remarks, please? Anna, over to you. This is working, yeah. So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be among uh, such a distinguished uh, uh, panel. Just let me share with you a few thoughts, uh, not just uh, us, uh, Romania is the presidency of the European Council, and uh, energy security is one of the um, uh, objectives, uh, priorities that we pushed uh, during our presidency, even though uh, Britain is giving us some headaches. And I do have the right to say that because I'm married to a Brit for 20 years, so nobody is perfect in that regard. But um, uh, to share some thoughts uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a country as well. As Romania, what have we done on... Uh, energy security on promoting um, this important uh, uh, objective uh, in our region and beyond our region. Um, I want to congratulate the organizers for uh, putting together this such an important uh, uh, and uh, you know putting this topic on the agenda, high on the agenda. And um, um, it is, um, it is uh, you know, beyond words, how can we uh, uh, what can we do and what can we uh, uh, learn from the past? But likewise, you know, the history always teaches us that and taught us that it's important to learn from the past to build the present and especially uh, to build uh, the future. So I think uh, Central and uh, Southeastern European countries are still uh, burned by insufficient integration and lack of connectivity. Uh, this is a legacy from times when infrastructure integration was deliberately uh, prevented in order to maintain national rules and also high levels of dependency upon a single supplier. This must no longer be the case, and one of the biggest challenges that must uh, be met uh, to complete the European integration is the development of infrastructure networks that will bring together um, the economies of the region with those of the West. And I think, in my opinion, important steps have, uh, have already been taken towards this objective, but obviously it's a work in progress. Uh, it is uh, important that we can uh, focus from rather fixed, single-angled approach towards a multilateral phased one, encompassing new sources, discoveries, technologies, materials, and regulatory measures in order to avoid uh, inadequacy and irrelevance uh, with a view to achieve sustainable uh, growth in our region. And I can tell you that Romania is a very strong promoter of any form of regional cooperation that can bring added value in terms of security of supply. And we are always open to explore relevant initiatives in areas such as energy, security, interconnectivity of uh, transport networks and corridors. And our uh, main focus in advancing regional market integrations throughout the need of regulatory and infrastructure development within the European Energy uh, Union Initiative and in line with the uh, energy community objectives. And probably you know that uh, one of uh, the toughest uh, dossiers uh, that has been at the EU level for uh, two years now 
it was the gas directive. And I'm very proud that uh, during our presidency, practically within less than a month since we assumed the, pres we assumed the presidency of the European Council, Romania closed that directive, uh, reaching a consensus among uh, uh, pre pretty much all the member states. Well, I think it was just one country to who opposed it, and now it's in the European Parliament. And that, you know, that directive, it wasn't against somebody per se, it was actually to secure a, a fair competitiveness and to secure uh, a possibility of um, di uh, diversification and practically, let's speaking openly among friends, even though we are on a live stream, but uh, those are, this is public knowledge and it's a policy assumed and should be assumed by all member states, meaning to uh, secure the uh, less dependence of, uh, of the European countries, member states from one single supplier. Coming back to our region, I think the advancement of the southern gas corridor is a fact and we are glad to consider that it has the potential to becoming a groundbreaker into the interregional economic development and this project integrated in the SEG are uh, attracting the attention of multi you know a, a lot of investors being major oil and gas companies international financial institutions and it's our hope that will have a multiplied economic uh, effect both upstream and downstream by providing significant investment uh, incentives. And uh, of course, I have a lot of talking points and I'm grateful uh, for, for you bearing with me, but I will save some for, uh, for some questions. But I can tell you that uh, um, from our point of view, uh, the, uh, the resources in the Black Sea uh, could uh, provide the security uh, energy security of, uh, of contributing to the energy security of uh, the uh, European member states. Um, we welcome the recent uh, efforts aiming at formalizing the energy cooperation between the states sharing the interest for the East uh, Mediterranean basis. The announcements of the establishment uh, on uh, January 16 in Cairo of the East Med Gas Forum consisting of Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Italy, Jordan, Palestine and Egypt could represent a decisive step towards articulating a common resources exploitation program. And we consider the energy dialogue under this format that can contribute to foster further diplomatic gains for the benefit of all parties involved. And um, the LNG terminals and their sub, uh, substantive uh, networks of gas and electricity grids would uh, uh, diversify the energy of uh, uh, the sources of energy for the whole uh, for the whole Europe. And uh, this is uh, exemplified by the LNG terminal uh, complained in uh, uh, Sunowski, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in Poland, uh, the one uh, um, underway in uh, Kirk, uh, which was recently announced to receive an important financial boost from the Croatian authorities and the LNG terminal in Greece, uh, which would enable Central Europe to tap the increasingly global energy market, including shipments uh, from the United States under the right set of regulations and market conditions. As you may know, uh, we have huge investment opportunities uh, that are considered in the Black Sea region. I mentioned a few, and our friends from Exxon uh, and others do know that, and it's our hope uh, that we will, um, together we work very closely. Uh, for the infrastructure development, including in the energy transport and and or production. And maximizing the Black Sea economic potential for the benefit of the extended region is a requirement and energy opens up uh, significant opportunities that we intend to use uh, for this purpose. And we welcome the presence of major investors in the Black Sea. Uh, and we are open to continue the dialogue on the investment framework of this uh, sector. I will just say one word about BRUA, the interconnector. The BRUA is a good example of efficient project management, having been credited as a regional priority by the European Commission and receiving a substantial EU financial support for its uh, construction as means towards contributing to the regional security of supply. And in that regard, I should bring to your attention uh, the, uh, that BRUA, among other projects, are from uh, the projects that are being uh, uh, pushed uh, uh, as a result of uh, the 3C summit that we held in uh, September last year in, in Bucharest. Um, and uh, if I come back to the BRUA, you know the development, but in a few words, uh, the first uh, phase of the project will be finalized by the end of this year. 
and uh, you know practically uh, will uh, able to easily attract gas from different uh, sources, including the Black Sea. And if you if you have any other questions about the Bro, I am at your disposal to answer some questions. All these initiatives, which mostly occurred during the last decade, are crucial for the completion of an efficient single energy uh, European energy market that can receive inputs of uh, uh, hydrocarbons from a variety of current and prospective uh, European countries, but also from non-European external suppliers and distributed throughout Europe on competitive, non-discriminatory basis. And practically what I'm trying to say here is that energy... Energy security is not just uh, empty words, uh, are not just empty words. Uh, energy uh, security, it's about the security at large. And uh, I think too many times uh, this has been used as a, as a weapon by uh, certain actors or actor. And I think it's uh, time to, um, you know, in a, in a, uh, with a fair dialogue and uh, in a very open, um, uh, transparent dialogue, we should make sure that um, um, uh, uh, securing the energy security in Europe, and for that matter in our region, is a matter of high importance and it's a matter of uh, high security. And that's why um, during our presidency, as I said, we... Uh, we are continuing to uh, advance the debate on the future of energy system in the energy union designated to ensure the energy transition and the achievements of energy and climate change objectives. And a very important uh, uh, moment, as I mentioned from the very beginning, and we are very proud of that, and we thank all our partners, including Greece, uh, our gracious uh, host uh, of uh, this very important event, uh, because that was a milestone in, um, you know, for the present, but especially for the for the future. And we are asking your support to um, uh, to have the uh, the mandate that we got in the core repair to actually get it to the vote in the European uh, Parliament. I will mention just uh, a few words about uh, the you, case of can Republic you of Moldova. Bring your remarks towards an end. Can I just make one final comment about? Republic of Moldova, because that's within the region and assuring the energy security of the region. Um, Romania, uh, along with other uh, uh, like-minded countries, uh, are playing an important role in uh, securing energy security of Republic of Moldova. And just two weeks ago, I was uh, representing the Romanian government, uh, opening up the final termination of the gas interconnector in Moldova, assuring that uh, some other uh, suppliers, meaning from Romania in this particular case, will, the gas will go through Moldova, Republic of Moldova, and assuring and contributing practically to a less dependent Republic of Moldova from a certain uh, supplier. So thank you so much, and uh, uh, thank you for bearing with me to share with you those thoughts, and I am at your disposal to answer any other questions. Thank you. Madam Birchall, thank you very much indeed. Um, we now have the uh, Greek Energy Minister in this capacity. Mr. Sathakis, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back uh, to the Delphi Forum. Uh, it has always been an excellent experience to discuss uh, issues of energy. Let me summarize uh, under what arrangements uh, the energy sector is under is in a period of a huge transformation. There are three sets of arrangements. The first has to do with the climate change. The second has to do with the way uh, that the energy market will function. And the third has to do with issues of energy security and uh, geopolitics. I will start with the first climate change. Practically, the targets are set for 2030 and indica in an indicative fashion for 2050. I'll stick to the 2030 targets. The European uh, targets have been set, so each national plan and the Greek national plan submitted already to the Commission indicates uh, the targets for 2030. Let me summarize the basic idea. 
in 2030, we will produce 32% of our energy consumption by, uh, through renewables. And B, we will have to spend 32% uh, less energy than 2007. Practically, it means that uh, having uh, at the current stage, having one-third renewables, one-third gas, and one-third lignite. Uh, unfortunately, we have the islands, too many of them, where we produce with petrol and oil. Uh, that's about 10% of our energy production. The energy mix will drastically change, and we will have the reduction of lignite to 17%. Gas will remain stable, and whatever new a share will be renewables, which will reach 56% uh, instead of 29 that is today. So in terms of the energy structure, it's more or less a clear path on how to reach the two, two, 2030 target. On the energy saving, I think that uh, that's uh, uh, <coughs> A highly articulate task. Uh, there is a lot to be done because uh, uh, I have the feeling that we are well behind in both in terms of policies in uh, energy saving uh, plus in uh, attaining a very high rate of reduction of our energy consumptions, which is 1.5 percent annually. So there is an area where I think uh, a lot has to be discussed, and um, uh, in this respect, um, we are uh, trying to figure out, particularly in transport, heating, and other areas, how the policies will be effective to attain this target. The second area, the second set of arrangements, has to do with the regulated markets and how the energy markets will function. That implies a whole set of reforms. More or less, those reforms have been completed until now. Let me mention uh, some of them. Uh, market liberalization. All markets have been liberalized. Gas, electricity, wholesale, retail, and the rest. Unbundling. It's almost completed. That means unbundling the networks from uh, the retail business and uh, do not have vertical activities. Third, uh, the introduction of the energy exchange market uh, is going according to schedule. It will function at the end of 2019. Uh, the new system for determining the prices of renewables, we have uh, uh, replaced, uh, we all have market tender processes for the renewables already. And uh, last but not least, uh, the energy community is the introduction of a new uh, form of developing renewable energy through consumers themselves either communities or local authorities or uh, others that might participate in the production of their own energy, net metering plus uh, the production of additional energy if, they, if, the, if this is the case. Uh, so the, this set of arrangements uh, determines uh, how these regula regulated markets will function and at the same time, uh, it moves towards the direction of the standard European model, the target model, which implies that the markets have to do, be interconnected with either our regional markets, the Balkans, uh, or other uh, European uh, neighbors, Italy. Uh, the full implementation of the target model will be in place actually by 2020. The third set of arrangements has to do with national uh, security. There, there are a whole area of issues that have been uh, raised. First of all, it has to do with the diversification of energy uh, sources. Uh, you are all familiar that uh, the large-scale investment that we have in pipelines and other interconnections 
uh, have a, as their main aim to di diversify uh, the source of energy. And in this respect, Greece has been in a privileged position. We have the completion of TAP, a major project. Uh, the, con the start of the construction it was in the last weeks, it was licensed, fully licensed, of IGB, the vertical corridor. Uh, we have the very large project of the East Med, which we are looking forward. And uh, in this respect, uh, it's very good news to have findings, new findings in uh, Cyprus. Plus, uh, we were very happy that uh, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum was established in Cairo, mentioned already, uh, where East Mediterranean uh, 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 countries, Italy, Jordan, the Palestinian Authority, Israel, Cyprus participated, and we look forward for having a broader participation in the Gas Forum. Um, so practically there is a whole range of ongoing projects and uh, potential projects that uh, diversify the source of energy and uh, establish a high degree of regional cooperation among our countries, neighboring countries, in order to exploit all this potential. In this respect, uh, hydrocarbon exploitation in Greece is of great interest. Uh, as you know, we have ratified, ratified already five contracts for hydrocarbon exploitation and drilling. Two more are, pend are pending, uh, which uh, refer to the recent international competition tenders uh, for fields in southwestern Crete and the Ionian Lie Sea to be practically ratified the coming months. So, there are seven projects that have been in full, more or less, uh, completion. Um, and we look forward to have uh, uh, a more profound uh, uh, results on uh, both on uh, Greece participation as an upstream uh, country and at the same time uh, integrating projects which are of huge strategic importance with uh, in Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I'll suggest that you uh, conclude I'll there. I'll make the last comment, yes. Um, practically, the, there is more or less a clear path, a set of reforms, and a set of very uh, uh, major projects which come to a, a significant conclusion. The energy sector will require according to this three set of arrangements, a huge uh, investment, we, according to our national plan, that will be 32 billion in the next decade. Uh, and look, we look forward that we shall all share this basic idea of attaining targets for climate change, reforming our energy markets, and at the same time, uh, safeguarding uh, that there will be a diversification of resources and exploitation of all potential. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are now going to have to speed things up quite considerably. Uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Gerasimus Thomas to make some comments uh, concerning how the EU views energy in this region and it, indeed the environment as well? Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I think the two uh, previous speakers have highlighted the two major pillars of European policy, the security aspect, energy security and the diversification, which has an objective also to reduce our energy bill, and also the climate change objectives. I want to highlight that uh, the pace of this transformation has to be very fast. Um, we have targets for 2030. Uh, we have targets for 2020, the starting point. We are okay going into 2020, but the pace of transformation to 2030 uh, is challenging. And I would just like to highlight one issue. By 2030, if we achieve everything that we have uh, set out to achieve, we will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a bit higher, more than 40%. 
If we have no policy change after 2030, if we keep these policies of the next 10 years, we will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by mid-century. And we have stated that we want to be almost decarbonized. So you can see the challenge of, uh, you know, going from 2030 to 2050, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, quite important. So the pace of transformation has to be uh, very uh, fast. Uh, on, on, um, in, do, in doing that, we are looking at energy supply, energy demand, and land use. We have to uh, act in three areas. So on energy supply, renewables have been mentioned, the interconnections have been mentioned. We need to think of storage, so it's not possible. Uh, so we need to think of new technologies. So technological transformation in the energy sector will be an important complementary driver. But about the region, I think, uh, um, as Mr. Stathaki said, uh, here we have a good starting point. Renewables uh, targets in Greece will be achieved. Interconnections are higher than the interconnections that we have as an average in Europe. So these two targets are not a problem uh, for Greece uh, where we are today. Uh, energy demand. I think energy demand uh, will require tremendous change. Energy efficiency, 75% of our emissions come from buildings. Renovation of buildings and transformation of mobility will uh, pro prove an important challenge for Greece and for the whole of Union. And then we have to think about land use, the CO2 sink, our forests, how we organize our cities. So it's an uh, important comprehensive uh, policy area that we have to deal and govern. Last I will mention and to finish investment. We estimate that we will need about uh, 400 billion uh, euros investment per year to go from here to 2030. And it will require a lot of private investment, the regulatory framework that has been put by the Union, the Presidency, the Council, um, uh, and the Commission uh, provides the right uh, um, incentives. We are putting together from the point of the EU budget a considerable also financial package to accompany this transition. This has to leverage private investment. So uh, just to give you some numbers, out of the uh, so-called cohesion and European structural funds in the budget of 2021 to 2027, a seven-year budget that we have in Europe, um, we will allocate 25% on uh, energy transition and climate change. This will amount to about 70 billion euros over a seven-year period. Out of our technology program, the Horizon Europe program, we will allocate 35 billion uh, to climate change and energy transition. Out of the Invest EU, the uh, program that will succeed the so-called Juncker Fund, we will allocate 30%. Uh, it's a uh, will amount to investment of 200 billion that will be targeted to do these actions. And then we have uh, specific uh, other small actions like the Connecting Europe Facility, the LIFE program will amount about 10 billion. So it's important to put the resources from Europe and from the member states to leverage the private investment in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think to speed things up even further, and uh, your, the brevity of your remarks and the conciseness is welcomed, uh, can I just ask a couple of questions to Ambassador Morningstar just to kick off? The first question is, why should the U.S. be interested in European energy security? This is a question that I've had to answer for the last 25 years since I've been involved uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, it's really not all that difficult. Uh, and t to some extent, uh, Vice Prime Minister uh, Birchall uh, addressed this issue uh, indirectly. Uh, the bottom line is that energy security relates to economic security. Uh, Economic security and energy security together relate to political security. So the United States has very much a stake in European uh, energy security for those reasons. Uh, Europe and the United States are the two lar are the largest trading and investment partners in the world. Uh, a strong American economy is critical to Europe. A strong European economy is critical to the United States. 
and from a political security standpoint, uh, an energy secure Europe uh, makes it harder or will make it harder as it develops more for other countries to use energy as any kind of a tool to, uh, to weaken Europe. Uh, so uh, very briefly, uh, that's why we have a stake in the United States. Uh, and uh, we can't, you know, the United States can't tell the European Union or European member states what to do. Um, we can't want energy security more than, more, than, uh, more, than, more than Europe does. But I think we do have reason to uh, make our views known and that uh, it's important that we constructively cooperate with Europe uh, to uh, uh, work through these issues. What about the commercial side? Are U.S. LNG exports to Europe viable as a commercial operation in the long term, or can they be undercut by Russia? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question, and the market is going to determine that. Uh, and when one looks at U.S. LNG uh, today, although some is coming to Europe, in fact, there are shipments that have been made to the Revatusa, Rev, Revatusa terminal, if I have it right, uh, here in Greece, uh, which, uh, which is very important. Uh, <clears throat> it's still going to be the market that determines the competitiveness because prices are higher in Asia today. Uh, much more U.S. LNG is going to Asia uh, than to Europe. It, it's an interesting question, you know, what does this mean with respect to uh, Russia? In one sense, uh, it doesn't matter how much LNG comes from the United States to Europe or from Qatar or from Algeria uh, or wherever. Most important is that the LNG be available because the availability of that LNG forces uh, Russia or any other competitor uh, to keep its prices uh, to the point where it can compete uh, and uh, well, and it also promotes the transparency uh, of, uh, of those agreements. So <clears throat> it, I look at the LNG issue, yes, we want to sell a lot of LNG. Don't get me wrong. But I think most important uh, are the geopolitical implications of our having LNG available uh, so that uh, uh, from the standpoint of promoting a competitive market. If I may, in turn, very quickly to Tristan Asprey, uh, I'm wondering if you can give us some indications on ExxonMobil's increasing interest in LNG, and indeed, uh, tell us something about your work both in East Med and offshore Romania. Thank you. Uh, there'll be a couple of slides to come up here in just a second, but while they're brought up, let me just say that in, in these few minutes of remarks, I wanted to hit upon two themes. Firstly, the supply and de demand dynamics of a very important source of energy for Europe, which is natural gas, and then secondly, to talk about the growing importance of southeastern Europe as a potential source of new natural gas supplies into Europe to promote that energy security. Let me start on the demand and supply side of the equation. The chart on the screen behind me there shows natural gas demand in Europe, broken out by different areas of Europe, from 2000 to 2040. It's actual data to today, and then our projection out to 2040. You'll see we're in 2019 today, of course, that's about the middle of that chart. We're seeing uh, rising demand for natural gas in Europe, which we think will level out in around the 2030 time frame and be about flat, but it's not equal all over Europe. Northern and Central Europe, demand is actually flat to down at the moment. It's really the areas of Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and Turkey where demand is growing. How is that demand met? This next chart is exactly the same data. It's just showing the supply, how that demand is actually met. In the red is the gas production from within Europe, what we call the indigenous or local supplies. In yellow are pipeline imports, and in the orange color at the top are the imports of the liquefied natural gas, or LNG. If you look at the red at the bottom of that, you'll see that local gas production in Europe is falling precipitously. It's down over a third since 2000. It's gonna fall another 50% or more by 2040 which means that imports are going to have to increase. Europe already imports more than half of its natural gas requirements from a variety of sources, mostly by pipeline today, pipelines from Russia, from Norway, from North Africa, uh, but also some as LNG. 
Uh, we see both pipeline and LNG imports rising, in particular those of LNG as we go out to 2040. That's, that's inevitable. This part of Europe, as has been mentioned already, is certainly becoming a more important gateway, an additional gateway for bringing energy into Europe. Uh, specifically here in Greece with the TAP pipeline, which is helping to bring Caspian Sea gas to European markets, the Remethusa LNG terminal, and other LNG terminals that have been or are being built in southeastern Europe. Natural gas is important to Europe for many reasons, but it's helping several countries meet what we refer to as the dual energy challenge, supplying the energy that we all need to consume, growing global demand for energy, while simultaneously reducing the environmental impact of that energy production, in particular CO2 emissions. I'll just highlight one country, my own, the United Kingdom, where a combination of increased of natural gas in power, along with wind power, has almost eliminated coal from the power generation mix. Natural gas uh, emits less than half the emissions of CO2 than coal when used in power generation. So effectively eliminating coal has allowed the UK to reduce its total country emissions by almost a third, 32% since 2005. That's about 2.5% a year. It's a very, very rapid fall in greenhouse gas emissions. My second and final slide in the interest of brevity, uh, this is a map, obviously, of Europe showing oil and gas fields, uh, areas where we have an interest. Uh, we hold blocks are in yellow. You'll see the majority of oil and gas fields are up in the North Sea. That's where most oil and gas production comes from today, offshore the United Kingdom, Norway, on and offshore the Netherlands in particular. But it's not where the industry started. The oil and gas industry was established in Europe, in fact, the world, in the Carpathian regions of Romania. And we see the southeastern part of Europe as a major potential new source of gas supply to help reverse that steep decline you saw in the red color. Just a few examples, along with our partner, OMV Patrom, in Romania and the Black Sea, we have made several gas discoveries. We're working with our partner and the government there to bring those into development in the future. Just a couple of days ago, well-timed for this conference, we announced a new gas discovery offshore Cyprus with our Calypso well. It was drilled with the Stenner Ice Max drill ship, you can see there in the top right. Significant new find, we're very pleased with it, and we look forward to more exploration in that block. Last year, we were awarded, along with Tatal, who will be the operator, and Hellenic, our friends at Hellenic, uh, two blocks offshore southwestern Greece and Crete, and that's going through the formal government and parliamentary approval process. We very much hope that'll be wrapped up here soon so we can start our exploration work in a very large area that's never seen exploration drilling before. And just finally, just a couple of weeks ago, we were awarded Block 3 offshore Egypt, another potential source of new supply. So in summary, we believe all these areas of perspective all could bring new sources of gas into Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristram, for a remarkably succinct presentation. Um, our final contribution today is from Ghassan Anbar. And uh, if you'd like to open up, uh, welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to present you the uh, uh, interconnections, electrical interconnection by submarine cable between the uh, European grid and the uh, southeast Mediterranean grid. This uh, slide shows you the, the Mediterranean, uh, which is absolutely wonderful uh, big lake, uh, and the, the connections between the creek and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Libya, the uh, eastern uh, interconnections, what we say uh, European, uh, sorry, eight countries interconnections, Libya, uh, Egypt, uh, Jordan, Israel, uh, Syria, and so. This is the uh, main uh, suppliers of uh, uh, energy to Europe, uh, Russia, Qatar, Arabia Saudi, and so. Mm. And now, this is very important. Uh, the European Commission start the uh, uh, interconnections, how to interconnect the European uh, grid with the South uh, Mediterranean and then with Africa. The mid-ring studies show that the land cable was, is, uh, wasn't possible. There's a lot of flows, and uh, there will be some monopoly, you know, for the uh, countries 
uh, around Europe, mainly Morocco and Turkey. And then there was uh, Desertec, Desertec Industrial Initiative, and Desertec, this is German initiative, and Desertec Foundation to promote energy, renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Et and they met grid, this is Mediterranean grid, and this is French initiative. I, uh, I was co-founder and uh, executive vice president. And uh, the mission of MedGrid was to, to study the submarine uh, interconnections between North and South Mediterranean, because the technology is there in France, United States, Germany, and so on. So. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the connectors in, uh, in uh, green uh, light, this is the leg one project. L like Libya, E like Egypt, and the G like Greece. This is the first step for 2,000 megawatt. I think it's important to know that this is not the only uh, project to interconnect uh, Europe to, to Africa. Uh, there's four or five projects, uh, Euro-Asia project, Euro-Africa, our project, and uh, two new. This is all of them, it's 2,000 megawatt uh, hour, 2,000 megawatt, all of them. It's between 1,000 uh, kilometers and uh, 1,770 for, for Egypt interconnections. We are, our, intercon our connectors, it's about 304 kilometers for 2,000 megawatt. Uh, I think it's, it's important, you know, to show the uh, opportunity, the geopolitic and the strategic inter, uh, uh, interconnections for Greece. It's naturally Greece will be connected probably to more important and rich uh, country in the, in the South Mediterranean, which is Libya. Libya is 1.7 square million uh, kilometers. And uh, uh, yesterday, the uh, former prime minister of Libya said it's 6.3 million people. There's gas, natural resources, solar, and so. So this is the project of uh, green power. We study the submarine uh, measurement. This is our uh, software. And uh, we study the connections to Tobruk. But during our negotiation and working with the GECOL, with the General Electricity of uh, Libya, probably we will go to Derna. Uh, so we will be, uh, I don't know about 285 kilometers and not 300, which is good for us. Mm? But I think it's important, uh, Your Excellency, uh, the Minister, uh, probably you have to look very, very well the uh, Tobruk area, where it will be uh, a huge Chinese uh, investment. We can, we, can, we can speak later about that. Uh, so, yeah, I forget to tell you that depth maximum of this connection is 2,500 2, meters depth, which is, and there's no uh, territory water conflict, uh, only to, to, to states. So it, I think it's very, very important uh, opportunity for uh, Europe, and this is in the, in the framework of the European Commission and the European Union to diversify and secure energy sources. The, uh, in last August, the European Commission makes for each project a cost-benefit analysis. And uh, we were positively surprised that the cost-benefit analysis for this area of, uh, with the leg one project it's about 485 million per year. The budget 
for the connectors, it's about one, 1.1 billion maximum. Uh, but we, uh, we would like to make about 150 megawatt solar. Uh, not really one solar uh, station plant, but we study with the Libyan, and I would like to share with, the, with my colleague here and with the Ministry of, of Energy in Greece. L Libya, uh, there's wonderful solar uh, radiation, but you know, each area is different. And the idea is to implement 50 mega, 30, 20 in each area, and to connect all this uh, uh, solar uh, plant to our ND center in Greek, in Greek, yeah, uh, and to associate university, big companies, and so on and so. And this will be uh, very important things for producer of technology, you know. Uh, I, 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 I tested it I, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the 19 uh, years when I was in banking electronics and especially ATM machines. We have the software to connect uh, all the uh, information and to compare the vari uh, variant and various technology uh, whatever the, the sources. So this we have to, to decide with the uh, uh, Greek administrations, I mean, uh, Ministry of Energy and with Libyan Gikot. Thank you. In Thank the you. end, this is can what- you, Can you bring your remarks to a close? Sorry? So we can, can you bring your remarks to a close so that we can open up to the audience? Yeah, please. Um, we've got, Time for questions. So I want you to think, I have one question to ask Madam Birchall, which is, is the capacity of Brewer actually sufficient for potential Black Sea discoveries? And what are the questions concerning transit across Hungary? Before answering that, could I just make a comment about, uh, and a clarification, um, about the gas directive, because that's been a, an important, and it's an important milestone. So uh, the proposed uh, amended uh, directive is to ensure a uniform and transparent regulatory uh, framework at the EU level by extending the application of common European rules to interconnection projects with third countries. In other words, it's our uh, uh, expectation that once adopted, the directive will serve as an important guiding tool to achieve, uh, to, for the achievement of the European energy policy objective stated at the European Union strategy in such a way as to ensure transparent and predictable relations with all our partners, being, uh, you know, from, from our region, from the EU, or from uh, United States, or any other uh, third partners. And um, one comment uh, about Ukraine as well, because if we talk about partners in our regional approach, we need to further focus on Ukraine and its implication of its energy status of Europe. And I think it is imperative to express our solidarity with U Ukraine in this matter. And for that, uh, from that point of view, I'm, I think the vertical uh, corridor uh, strategic, uh, you know, the, the vertical cor uh, corridor is a strategic follow-up to TAP, if we can, uh, uh, speak that way. About BROA, BROA is an important project um, uh, for our region and I think uh, should, um, uh, should be uh, helped to be completed. Um, you know the history of BROA. That's why I mentioned the Three Seas Initiative and I see our friends from Atlantic Council here uh, in, in, in our room. They've done an amazing work um, uh, on uh, helping with uh, the Three Seas uh, Summit, and it's uh, very important to continue to actually have the implementation of, uh, of the projects because Three Seas Summit practically had uh, important regional projects um, uh, on energy uh, and uh, 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 transportation as well. So BRUA, yes, it's, uh, it's been, uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's been as a project um, 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 uh, 
if I can say, the EU level regarded as being a, a priority, and here I have uh, our colleague from, uh, from, uh, from Brussels, um, maybe can elaborate a little bit, but um, it's an important project which, in our opinion, will uh, contribute to the diversification, and why not, to uh, securing one more further step in the energy security in our region, and for that matter, uh, in the uh, EU. Because if we could speak very frankly, I mean, too many times the energy has been used as an economic tool, and I think that's wrong. I think energy um, and um, uh, uh, security of, uh, of uh, energy, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, overall security, and that's why we are working very closely with our, uh, you know, with the inventor, investors interested in the Black Sea to really contribute it, uh, uh, to that uh, diversification and uh, security because it's a matter for the present but uh, especially for the future. And I think we owe it uh, to, uh, to the future generations to make sure that the energy security is uh, for what uh, it's supposed to be. Thank you. Um, my name is Terios Ruyutoglu. Um, I'm an investor, and um, my, my, I have a lot of curiosity as a Greek to find out uh, what you think about the south of Crete um, potential, and especially how secure is um, the fact that it's literally a Greek project, and we won't have uh, any neighboring countries uh, try to destabilize it. Thank you. I think first of all, Tristan, and then maybe Dick wants to have a word. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. Uh, you saw on the map it's a very large area, but there's essentially no uh, modern geophysical information across it, which gives us a lot of excitement because we think there's a lot of geological potential there, but we don't, we don't know specifically what that is yet until we're able to have the blocks awarded and then we can acquire new geophysical data to get a look. But it's a very large area that's never seen a single exploration well. That's very unusual on and offshore Europe, which has been very heavily drilled over the centuries. So we're very excited about it. But before we can give you a better answer to the question, we need to get out in the water once the blocks are formally awarded, uh, hopefully later this year, and get the geophysical data we need to answer your exact question. I'll pass it to Dick, but I'm sure that uh, the Greek energy minister might wish to have a little word to say on this after. <laughs> Well, I am elected in Hanya in Western Crete, so my re-election re depends on, <laughs> <laughs> on a sound program. <laughs> so I of any real obstacles to, because it's a, uh, an area where I think there is no question about disputes or other issues. I'd, I'd like to use this question and answer to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the exciting news that Exxon uh, disclosed uh, the other day about findings, about findings that it's made. Uh, and to me, this could be uh, hugely significant. But the whole question of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for a lot of years, so. Uh, I've, said, I've said what I'm going to say for many, many years, also shows how old I am, uh, which is that ne never, in my view, never have, has there been so many opportunities for so many countries that can benefit those countries and benefit the citizens of those countries uh, with so many political impediments. And that it is absolutely necessary to resolve those impediments uh, in order for countries uh, to receive the benefit. I think it's very positive what Exxon announced. I know it's too soon to tell how <coughs> commercial uh, that project may be. Uh, but I think that Exxon's involvement can be an incentive to help to resolve these issues uh, and also an incentive, and it shouldn't be the only incentive, needless to say, for the United States to get very involved in trying to work through uh, issues uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
And so the hope is that this will, in fact, uh, lead uh, to resolution uh, and <clears throat> not lead to more conflict. The one other thing I would mention is apparently yesterday uh, uh, Cyprus passed legislation with respect to a sovereign wealth fund, uh, which would provide resources to all of Cyprus uh, from uh, uh, <coughs> from projects uh, uh, from projects in the region, and uh, I think that's also a very positive step. So I, I just hope that we can move towards uh, resolution and away from conflict as these new discoveries are made. It's always good when you hear of projects that are intended for both parts of Cyprus to treat it, to remember that it still is, at least legally, a unity. Uh, one question I was going to ask you, Mr. Thomas. Um, you were saying that it's going to take, that it's going to require 400 billion a year in investment to meet all the climate-related projects that are necessary to achieve EU targets. But in practice, do you have any estimate on what you think will actually be raised and spent? Because 400 billion seems an enormously large figure, and one questions whether in the current environment of cost-cutting, reduced economic growth, whether that amount of money will be made available. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think it is possible. Otherwise, we would not have been, uh, would have not produced legislation for this change. I think there is a major driver um, uh, all over Europe and all over the world, which is reducing uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, it is pays off. It creates jobs, and uh, it is possible to get the private sector involved. It is difficult also for me as a Greek to speak in this region. There is a, a lot of focus on fossil fuels, gas. We just had this uh, half of the conversation on this. But everywhere else, everybody is thinking on how to um, uh, expand to uh, non-fossil fuels areas. Look at storage. Look at batteries. The European Commission, we uh, launched the Battery Alliance you know, two years ago. And we have like five uh, big factories being built in Europe. Uh, we have raised, uh, you know, 50 million for its uh, new battery factory. We have financed through the FC, and we are about to, to finance a two billion factory in the north of Sweden. Um, so uh, uh, there is private investment that flows in these new areas, and it pays off. It is important to think about this, and it is an area that renewables and storage and new technologies is an area where Europe also can become an exporter, uh, um, as we have just uh, uh, reached an agreement with India on how to export our offshore wind technology and framework, or in other areas around the world. So um, areas that we can develop in Europe in power generation and we can export are feasible, and a lot of the energy efficiency investment, the majority of these 400 billion is on energy efficiency, uh, renewal of buildings, uh, it's happening uh, uh, already. So I think uh, um, there is a strategic decision to be made on uh, how much investment to put into climate change and how much investment to put into security, energy security. Uh, in general, uh, security is something that is costs, of why the efficiency is something that pays off. So I will leave it to that. Could I just make uh, yes. one uh, comment about BROA? As I mentioned, the first, uh, um, the first um, uh, phase will be finalized by the end of the year. And uh, when we will be talking about the phase two, uh, that to, actual, to answer directly to your question, the phase two, uh, on phase two, BROA will be able to easily attract gas from different sources, including from the Black Sea region, when uh, the resources from the Black uh, Sea region will be uh, will become available, and that will seriously uh, contribute to the energy security of uh, European Union. Yes, and I think just to to complement it, I forgot to mention before. Of course, for this very important priority project, we have. Uh, not only funding from the Connecting Europe facility, but we do have, uh, we have shown that we can get 
private sector funding. Look at TAP, for example, that went through. Look at BRUA. So uh, private sector funding, under the right conditions and the right framework, it is possible for interconnections, uh, for uh, uh, electricity markets. So this is not the optimum. I'll take, okay, I'm going to take all the questions very quickly, keep them short, and then I'll ask the panelists to answer some of them. Uh, first question. Hi, I'm Jacob Pesikoff from uh, CYA Dechemis and formerly Sonova Energy. Um, so a, a lot of these new pipelines and renewable projects are real, seem to be really great from an economic and climate change perspective in uh, mainland and accessible areas. How do you feel going forward with these projects with, on islands and other inaccessible places that are much more petrol dependent, which is environmentally worse and also much more expensive? Thank you, Thank you Khagani from Iran. Uh, we know that some politicians in Washington, in Israel, and sanctions in Iran are creating an environment that we may start a war in Persian Gulf again. What would have the effect on energy security of Europe? And there are three questions. Keep it very short. Uh, thank you. My name is Vasily Gavril. I'm from the Russian embassy here in Athens. Uh, I have a very short question. Given the fact that in February Russia has become the biggest supplier of LNG to Europe, overpassing not only the US but also Qatar, Ni Nigeria, Algeria, don't you think that the expansion and development of LNG terminals and infrastructure in, 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 in the EU uh, gives Russia an advantage because it, it allows it to, to send and deliver gas to those countries? Uh, to, to new, to new uh, consumers in, in the European Union. Thank you. And one more here. Actually. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yuri Pedesioano. I'm a lawyer. This is a question for Minister Stathakis. Uh, Minister Stathakis, is the Greek government uh, intend to pursue the interconnection of Greece, uh, of uh, Crete, uh, Attica as a national project in parallel with the project of common interest for the interconnection of Israel, Cyprus, Crete, Attica, sponsored by the European Commission, the government of Israel, of Crete, and until recently based on the declarations of That's Prime Minister Alexis we've Tsipras. Got, we've got, well, ask Mr. I'll have to close the questions there to give time for answers. Will you each just give very brief answers to the questions that you feel you want to address? And I'll start with you, Minister Stathakis, about the East Bed Pipeline. Okay, I mean, uh, as you know, our, uh, the island interconnection project is the most important project in Greece. We just completed Kiklades A, Mykonos, and other islands. The Peloponnesos, uh, Crete, is under construction, the second major interconnection. And uh, we have made a lot of progress. I hope we will find a solution for the immediate start of the third interconnection, which is Attiki Crete. Uh, it's a top priority. We spend 10% of our energy bill on the islands, uh, producing by oil. So we have to complete all island projects by 2022. That's the top priority. I think uh, we try to find solution rather than. Uh, um, Who would like to answer the question about LNG and Russia? Uh, you know, I don't know whether uh, the Russian, L Russian LNG 
uh, and some of the new supplies from Russia gives it really a competitive advantage. Uh, maybe it does in some areas in Europe. I don't know. I'm not sure if it would in southern Europe. I don't think that's the point, though. Fine. If Russia has a competitive advantage, that's okay. But that's the point, a competitive advantage. And the, the importance is that there be a competitive, transparent LNG market. And whoever can supply a country like Greece with the best price, uh, so be it. That country, should, uh, that country should do so. The main concern, again, from a geopolitical standpoint, is only that no country uh, use its supplies to an unfair advantage. But if there's a competitive, transparent market, which Russia clearly should be part of, that's fine. Let me make a comment on LNG. I think that the first is, uh, we saw the very interesting graphs from uh, Exxon about the uh, demand for LNG in the future. I don't know, I don't think these uh, uh, graphs include the potential for LNG uh, use in the maritime sector. So as I said, mobility will be transformed in the future and LNG uh, is, is very important potentially also for the maritime sector. What I would say is that uh, for gas, security is the, the primary objective. We have, uh, if we in, in, uh, implement all the projects of common interest that we have now decided, we would have built in Europe an import capacity of 175% our needs. 175% import capacity our needs. So we do have a diversified import capacity to deal with this issue of security. We shouldn't hide the fact that we over uh, uh, import, uh, the capacity to over import. I would like uh, to say also a comment on islands. It's extremely important uh, to connect the islands, and we have many, not only in Greece, Whichever solution every country takes about islands, it will be cheaper than the current solution of diesel. Whichever solution. Of course, we promote uh, uh, renewables plus storage, but whichever other solution you will have all over uh, the EU and the ultra, uh, the, uh, over uh, the long islands that we have from France, the way it will be cheaper than the current solution. Tristan, over to you. Thank you. Just, just a quick response to the comment. Uh, there is actually a small amount of LNG for use beyond power generation in the forecast, both not just for maritime use, but also for trucks. Uh, that could certainly be a sector that expands, but we do incorporate the future demand for that product as well. I'll just build briefly on Ambassador Morningstar's comments. I think the real um, key point about LNG is it's effectively globalizing the natural gas market. In Europe, I think there are now 17 or 18 different LNG terminals. There are multiple countries around the world supplying LNG, including Russia. Uh, and that, that's only going to promote energy interdependency and security. And we have a final kicker question. Security or insecurity stemming from the Persian Gulf? <laughs> I'll pass it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm not in the government in the United States, so I can say I, uh, I do not agree with the decision to withdraw uh, from the Iranian nuclear agreement. Uh, hopefully that's not going to lead uh, to more tension and conflict. Uh, but from the standpoint of European energy security, I think at least at this point it doesn't have, it, it won't have any significant effect. Uh, certainly won't have any effect on gas. Uh, and with respect to oil, I think the supplies are sufficient enough at this point uh, that uh, Europe's, uh, uh, Europe's energy needs uh, can be taken care of. Uh, hopefully that will last, uh, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. We are actually going to manage to do the impossible and to finish on time. So can I thank uh, Anna Birchall very much? Can I also thank, thank George Tsatakis, uh, Gerasimov Thomas, Ambassador Richard Morningstar, Tristan Asprey, and a great apology to Gassan Ibn Abrov for failing to give you a second chance, Mr. Anbar, to come back on electricity. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Aphoristic.